Uh, speaking of pitch and yaw, the thing, uh, so Starship flips on its belly flops. There's a interesting kind of maneuver uh, on the way down to land. Uh, can you describe that maneuver? What's involved with that? Yeah, so this is definitely a first. I don't think anything's tried landing like this before, but the idea is when you're falling through the atmosphere, the atmosphere could actually do a lot of work for you. You know, you're moving quickly. Something is falling from space. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of energy involved. You have a really good video on this as well. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, the uh, as it's falling, you know, you can you let the you want to let the atmosphere do as much work as it can. And so, um, if you have a, a unsymmetric, you know, it's not a ball that's falling. This is some kind of object with with shape. Some, you know, at at one face of it is going to have more surface area than the other face. So, you know, in the in the shape of like a cylinder, if you're falling, you know like a soda can, if you're falling top or bottom first, it's a, a certain amount of surface area. If you flip that on its side, you actually have a lot more surface area. So with the same exact vehicle, you can actually have a lot more drag. You can actually slow it down a lot more using the exact same, like same atmosphere, same, same vehicle. Just by turning it 90 degrees, you can slow it down substantially, like three or four times slower. So that's energy that you don't have to use anywhere else. You, know, you don't have to use an engine to slow you down. You don't have to do anything else. So SpaceX realized, okay, if we flip this thing on its side and let it fall like a skydiver almost, you know, instead of like pencil diving into the pool, you're belly flopping. You're maximizing the amount of surface area that's in the wind stream that's being slowed down. But obviously like in order to land, especially if you're SpaceX and, you know, Elon's obsessed with like not having different parts, you know, he wants the best part is no part. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to land with the engines, you might as well use engines that you've already have the the engines that are you know used for the other portions of flight. So you kick those on and you use those engines to actually turn it ninety degrees from belly flopping to feet first. And that way you can use those same engines to land, and you don't have to have like auxiliary landing engines. You don't have to have forces. You know, even if you were to land like on its belly with a, a separate set of engines. Not only would those engines weigh a lot, you know, and be extra complexity, et cetera, et cetera, but you also don't have to make the ship be able to handle landing, you know, like on its belly, as opposed to having the forces be vertical through it. But it's a giant thing. <laughs> you have to rotate in it's the air. Huge. And uh, as you also highlight, you know, there's liquid fuel slushing around in the tank. <laughs> so like you can't, uh, I guess use that fuel directly you have to have another kind of fuel. Like there's just complexities there yeah. that are involved. Uh, plus the actual maneuver uh, is difficult from the, like, w like what are the thrusters that actually make that, um, make all that happen? You're, you're adding a lot of complexity, uh, not a lot, but your complexity to the maneuver and possibility where failure could happen uh, in order to sort of save, in order for the air to do, uh, some of the work. So what what is some of that complexity? Just you can linger on it. You know, if we if we think about what it's going to take to go from horizontal to vertical, um this rocket in particular, the Starship has these big flaps. Um so it has kind of two nose flaps and two uh rearward flaps. The rearward flaps are a lot bigger because the majority of the the mass, the engines and stuff are in the back of the the vehicle. So in order to kind of be stable, and they just fold themselves inwards like di on their dihedral angle at a dihedral angle in order to uh, increase or decrease the drag. So you can control its all three axes of control while it's falling uh, you know, on its belly, you can control it that way using these four different fins. So you have these giant moving surfaces that take thousands of, of horsepower, it's just insane amount of torque in order to move these quickly enough to be a valid control surface. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge complication is moving these fins and, and developing that, that landing algorithm and the, you know, the control for a, a huge vehicle with flaps going like, you know, in and out, in and out, in and out to stay stable. Then right as you light the engines, now all of a sudden you want the top, you know, the, you want to flip the rocket 90 degrees. So the rearward flaps, the bottom flaps fold in, they tuck all the way in to minimize drag. That's going to make it want to, you know, swing down. You extend the upper flaps. That makes it so the nose wants to pitch up. You kick on the engines. Um, they're now lighting all three engines, at least as, as of the last like successful attempts, they light all three of the sea level Raptor engines and they're pitched all the way, like, you know, 10 or 15 degrees or whatever the, the maximum pitch is on them. And that induces, uh, you know, it does that kick maneuver to kick it over from horizontal to vertical. Now, the problem is you lit your engines while you're horizontal. So they 
put some horizontal velocity into the rocket. They're push the rocket. You know, at the time the nose is at the at the time of lighting those engines, the nose is facing the horizon and the engines are facing the opposite horizon. Yeah. So you now shot it a decent amount in an off, you know, the direction that you're not falling, you know. Um, so you have to factor that in to where you're landing, because you're going to land on this precise, in this case, you're going to land on the inside the arm, the loving arms of the chopsticks, you know, the Creed arms wide open, you're going to try to yeah. land inside this. That's exactly the song that you're playing through my head as I watch this now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for forever joining those two. <laughs> I appreciate this. And you have to very precisely control. So what you have to do is now that it's done that kick, you also have to cancel out that horizontal velocity. So it's actually going to rotate beyond 90 degrees to cancel out that horizontal velocity mm -hmm. and then modulate the engines to make it so the thrust, you know, is, is perfect so that it can control itself into a controlled landing. And all this is done in like 500 meters, like 1500 feet. You know, you're doing all of those things stupidly close to the ground. It looks absurd. So far they've done five of these tests. All, um, the first four all blew up, you know, um, they're all coming in from about 10 kilometers or 33,000 feet, um, falling, flipping, you know, and again, this thing is huge that just the booster or just the upper stage of this, um, is, is like 50 meters tall, you know, so it's uh, 150, well, it's, it's like 45 meters, about 50 meters tall, about 165 feet tall, um, nine meters wide. So 30 feet wide. It weighs, you know, something like, God, I don't remember if it's something like 120 metric tons. So 120,000 <laughs> kilograms, you know, two yeah. quarter of a million pounds empty, and it's doing this flip maneuver <laughs> and it has to do all this perfectly. So the first four, four attempts of this were pretty spectacular failures. So just to clarify, which stage is doing this maneuver? It's the upper stage is doing this belly flop maneuver. Yep. Uh, so this is the the stage that would presumably um, have humans on board if we yeah. were to use. <laughs> and uh, if, if things continue to plan. Now, here's, here's something <laughs> I would love to see. Yeah. Just saying this. Yeah. If you already have these big aero surfaces, the flaps, they also have to move. They're on heavy motors and hinges and flaps and all that stuff. I'm actually surprised that for Earth, they aren't just looking at landing it horizontally on a runway like the space shuttle. Ooh. I mean, Interesting. that worked. The Braun did it. You know, the Soviet Union's Braun. Uh, I rolled my R real hard there, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> really good. I'm very here. impressed. I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the Bron did it. We have other space planes like the X-37B. Yeah. Uh, we have the upcoming Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser. Uh, it's, yeah, you have some extra mass in the wings, but so does Starship. Starship has the extra mass of those flaps and, you know, the the, the motors and the hinges and all that stuff. I, I would like to see the, the trade on, like, is it actually lighter weight to do that versus doing what SpaceX is doing? So yeah, I mean that's the that's the funny thing. I, I think realistically, if Elon walks in the door tomorrow and says, "Guys, we did some simulations and actually it's like we can get another five thousand kilograms into space if we just land it horizontally. If we kind of give up on our ego and land horizontally, at least on Earth, then you know I think Earth. they could be that's doing true. that pretty quickly. Because that's the thing is, uh, this ultimate thing has been to land on Mars and you know other planets, and Mars doesn't have a runway, doesn't have. A, you know, a thick enough atmosphere to utilize aerodynamic flight like that. So you have to do propulsive landing for Mars. Um, you're going to land on an unprepared surface, you know, so it has to be able to do this at some point. Mm -hmm. the, the ultimate, it sounds ridiculous and it is, but the ultimate goal of it is to land on Mars. There's not much of an atmosphere to like, yeah. to help you with the, to, for the belly flop to be useful. There's only 1% the atmosphere on Mars as there is on Earth, but you still want to utilize as much of that atmosphere as possible. So at, in the upper atmosphere, it's still going to be coming in more or less uh, kind of perpendicular to the airstream. I guess it's probably more like, you know, 60 degrees, 70 degrees to the airstream, like where it's belly flopping. And it's going to especially do that on Mars. It's going to need to, you know, use up as let the little bit of atmosphere there is, you know, you're coming in at insane velocities. And so even that 1% thin atmosphere is still going to do a lot of work. Now on Mars, it, there's only 38% of Earth's gravity on Mars. So the belly flop maneuver is a lot, it, it could be a lot more conservative. You could do that at like 5,000 feet up and it just wouldn't matter as much because there's not as much gravity loss or gravity drag. So you can kind of just more slowly, gently, you know, you don't have to do this crazy extravagant like belly flop, you know, flip maneuver. Um, but it would still, something at some point you would transition from more or less perpendicular to the airstream to, you know, and horizontal to landing vertically. 
I like how we're having this old, boring conversation about the differences of landing on Earth versus on Mars. <laughs> uh, this, this is surreal that this is actually a real conversation, well, that and, uh, this is something that we're discussing. Yeah. Because it has to do both. Yeah. But in my opinion, <laughs> yes, I think we'll pretty quickly see an evolution of Starship that's like dedicated versions for certain tasks. Sure. And at the end of the day, Again, if if it's if someone runs a simulation and says it's actually more efficient and it's better just to land horizontally on a runway, then that's what's going to happen. You know, it 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 doesn't matter. But they still will develop. You know, if, if the ultimate goal is to land on Mars, then they'll have a dedicated Mars variant. You know, which will likely look different than the Earth variant. You know, and they'll still probably be launched on the same booster. You know what I mean? So there's- Oh, you mean like that particular vehicle will not be returning back to Earth. It'll need to be modified. Because uh, cause the ultimate is to have one starship that goes to Mars, lands on Mars, and takes off of Mars, lands back, back on Earth, Earth, and is reused again. Yeah. Over and over and over. And there's a chance that you, you know, you have just a, a cycler, just a, you know, if you're, if you, at the end of the day, you're just really trying to see what is most feasible, what's the most- Efficient. You literally have a vehicle dedicated to Mars. Mars is easy to do a single stage to orbit. Mm -hmm. It's a lot lower gravity, a lot thinner atmosphere. You can easily do a single stage to orbit. You get into orbit, you park to a dedicated, you know, transfer vehicle that goes between Earth and Mars. It only stays in space. You don't have heat shields. You don't have landing legs. You don't have all these things that you need. And ideally, it's nuclear powered. So it's super efficient. Mm -hmm. That gets you back to Earth. Once you're at Earth, you rendezvous again with another landing starship. And that starship might be horizontal runway starship you know like yeah there's no i i don't see the and i i think ultimately it'll win out where we don't have a one size fits all i think that's the that's the flaw of the space shuttle really is that it was trying to do everything and ended up kind of doing nothing well but that's i think what spacex has proven i mean spacex already has variants coming there's already going to be a dedicated lunar lander for nasa for the artemis program there's already going to be a tanker variant there's already going to be likely just a pure cargo version. There's likely going to be a human version. We'll likely see evolutions of this thing happen, you know, relatively quickly. And when, once it's all working, it's only a matter of weeks before people riding on it will be complaining about the speed of the Wi-Fi. <laughs> As the old like uh, Louis C.K. joke with like, we're, you're flying <laughs> on a chair through the air. Yes. It's you incredible. Didn't even, you didn't even know this existed and now you're <laughs> complaining about it. Uh, it's great. Exactly. Uh, so you uh, you tweeted fun fact about Starship by doing the flip around 500 meters versus higher up, like 2,000 2, meters. The difference in delta V is 500 uh, meters per second. That's a 20 ton fuel saving, which means basically 20 tons more you can put into orbit. That's more than uh, Falcon 9 has ever launched just by flipping later. That's really interesting. So there, that that was a decision too to flip close to the ground. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. closer to the ground, the better. The more, again, the more the atmosphere is doing work, and uh, you know, we get into that video really dives into like gravity losses and gravity drag. The more time you're spent, every every second that your rocket engine is running, Earth is stealing nine point eight meters per second of acceleration against you. Mm -hmm. There's just inherently nine point eight meters per second squared of acceleration. So every second that engine is running, the first a big majority of your thrust is actually being just stolen by Earth's gravity well. So if you're, the longer you're fighting that, the more inefficient it is. So ID, I mean, the best thing would be you flip at, you know, 100 meters off the ground, you light all your engines to maximum thrust and you pull 50 Gs, you know, mm -hmm. and you, you land on a dime, basically. Obviously there's no margin there. There's, you know, and there's diminishing returns on that that gravity loss thing and in your high thrust to weight ratios. So that's a pretty good compromise. Like, yes, it looks scary, but they could be a lot more aggressive with that yet and squeeze out even a little bit better performance, but there are diminishing returns. So that's kind of the, the magic number we're, we've seen so far today, but we'll likely see that you know be played with. 